Ah, let's see, where do I even begin? I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed by all these amazing people in the house. Are you good? I guess so. Okay. <laughs> let's dive right in, Robert England. Yesterday we talked all about Nightmare on Elm Street, which was badass, and I'm sure there's plenty of questions about it. I do want to touch on your later work, because uh, the rise of Leslie Vernon behind the mask. Has anybody seen that movie? Totally awesome. I know that is a recent movie for you, but what else have you been working on? Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Rise of Leslie Vernon behind the mask because I'm really proud of that. And, and, and Tommy, I, I do my homage in that to Donald Pleasance, the great Donald Pleasance, who I discovered in my college days in a Roman Polanski movie. And ever since then, I, I, I saw every single thing he did. So uh, if you get a chance, yeah, if you get a chance, check out uh, uh, The Rise of Leslie Vernon Behind the Mask. It's a great, great deconstructed horror. And you guys can all watch On Demand tonight and see me in the last showing, which, again, I'm really happy with. I star with Finn Jones from The Game of Thrones and uh, Emily Barrington, who was the terrorist daughter on uh, the last season of 24. She had her fingers chopped off. Uh, I think Kiefer did it, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's terrific. I play the old projectionist in a suburban mall cinema, and I've been remaindered, as they say in England, let go. And while I'm awaiting my retirement, I'm forced to work in the popcorn concession stand and humiliated, I take my revenge at the midnight movie. So last showing, check it out. And next February, for all you guys and ghouls, uh, it is finally the Fear Clinic. And Thomas Decker is awesome in it. Oh my God, I'm so nervous. I see Ken over here. Did he bring his machete? No, maybe he'll fall asleep. All right, I'm done. Awesome. I'm gonna just go down the line. John Kassir, I work in radio. I do tons of voiceover work myself, but I can't even hold a flame to you and your voiceover skills. Um, kind of a combo question. How were you discovered? Was it just a simple audition? Were you ever in any of the Tales from the Crypts because nobody knew your face till later? And part three of my question, any possible chance of Tales from the Crypt coming back? Loaded questions all the way around. <laughs> Let's see. Um, well, you know, I, I, I grew up in Baltimore, and I got my degree in theater, and I moved to... <laughs> What's better? Is that better? Can you hear me with this That's one? better. Good. Uh, and, I, and I got my first off-Broadway show, and I lived in New York working on the street, street performing and uh, doing off-Broadway theater, and... I eventually got in a, a part in a show called Three Guys Naked from the Waist Down, which was about stand-up comedians, and it starred a guy relatively unknown at the time named Scott Bakula, and a guy who was completely unknown at the time, John Kassir, and we played, a, we played some stand-up comedians, and it was a big hit off Broadway, and um, I was asked to do a show called Star Search, which was a brand new show hosted by Ed McMahon. And I went on the show, and they go, we want you to be a, uh, on the show. And I said, well, I'm not a stand-up comedian. They said, well, you can win $100,000. And I went, well, hell, I'll do it. <laughs> so uh, I beat Rosie O'Donnell in the semifinals. I beat, uh, it was completely unknown at the time, and um, beat Sinbad in the finals, and uh, won $100,000, and all of a sudden I had a TV career. And uh, so I used to do all these voices in my act because I didn't really have any jokes to tell. I'd do like The Wizard of Oz in two minutes. Like, As mayor of the Munchkin City and the county of the land of Oz, we welcome you most regally. Stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, so I landed my first series called First and Ten on HBO. Anybody remember First and Ten? It's about a football yeah. team, yeah? I played Zagreb Skanuski. He could kick 60-yard field goals. He was uh, from uh, <laughs> Bulgaria, and um, yeah, I know, right? Some of the things on my resume, I was just like, are you kidding me? And um, so HBO knew my work from there, and they asked me to audition for The Crypt Keeper. So I went, thank you. So I went down to Kevin Yeager's studio where they were having the auditions, and as you know, the creature maker 
uh, Kevin. He certainly knows Kevin from... Uh, we were all just passing ships in the night there. Yeah. yeah. He had created, uh, you know, looks for him and had created Chucky and all this stuff. In fact... Sleepy of, Hollow with Johnny Depp. Exactly. If, like, actually, a lot of people don't know this, but Kevin was, when he was making The Crypt Keeper, was making him out of spare parts out of his studio. These are actually Chucky eyes that he used in The Crypt Keeper, little known fact. Um, and uh, so I did this voice for him and he flipped. And the next day he had me doing it for uh, Joel Silver and Robert uh, Zemeckis and, um, and uh, uh, Richard Donner in their office. And they're like, okay, kid, you got the part. And I just thought they were jerking my chain because, you know, they do that all the time. They go, oh, we'll see you on the set. And you never hear from them again. And uh, that was 1988. And uh, Kevin does voices, too, when he's putting your makeup on. Kevin would do yeah. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis dialogue. So Kevin really has an ear for talent. <laughs> yeah, he's really great. He's, re he's talented. So he's, I don't know if you know this, but Kevin also directed all the, tales, all the Crypt Keeper sequences. You know, the, the bumpers on either side of the thing, which are, of course, sometimes the most brilliant part of every episode. And um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll take that as a backhanded compliment. And, um, but, uh, you know, they did have me on one episode. Lou Diamond Phillips was the star in it with Priscilla Presley and myself. Uh, Lou's here. Please go visit him. He'd love to meet you. And um, uh, called Oil's Well That Ends Well. And it was supposed to be the last episode of the sixth season, which was supposed to be the very last episode. And um, I pop up out of a casket like, I, like the Crypt Keeper does in the beginning of the show. And, and there's all this great stuff that happens. But um, it was supposed to be the, we wound up getting picked up for a seventh season that was shot in London. So it wound up not being the last episode. But I always loved that the Crypt Keeper was sitting there watching me on TV going, you know, those other hackers are good. But this one is a real gory Cooper. A Robert Deadford. And that voice, I could swear, reminds me of someone I know. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, and your last question about bringing the show back on the air. I mean, it was a very expensive show to do in its day. I think, I think John, that, that uh, there was a moment in time, because it was actually a, 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 almost a toy for Joel Silver and Zemeckis and them, they were really spending freely. Yes. And I know, according to Kevin, that, that one of the things that happened was a lot of my crew, including Gil Adler, went over to Tales from the Crypt because they had to work lean and mean yeah. in some of those last seasons. But it kept the show on, and those are some, for my money, those are some of the best episodes, those oh, later definitely. ones. Yeah. Definitely. They got a lot of favors. You know, they were very the biggest producers in the business at that time, and they could ask a lot of favors. They could get stars for scale. They could get, um, you know, the best makeup artists, the best effects guys. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's a hard show to produce today. I think that they would probably do it, but they don't have the rights anymore. The Gaines family has the rights. Um, I'm sure they may try to do something down the road with it. Uh, it may not involve the Crypt Keeper as you know him because they don't have the rights to the Crypt Keeper that I did uh, along with uh, Joel Silver and these guys. They call them the partners. And the partners still have the rights to the Crypt Keeper that I do. And um, so we'll see. We'll hope. We can all pray. I mean, there's 93 episodes for you guys to pick up, you know, and, and watch now. But um, it would be great, you know, keep those letters coming in, send them to Silver Pictures and say, where the hell is Crypt Keeper? I want to see a movie called Crypt Keeper. Crypt Keeper. <laughs> I think he should have his own talk show. Yes, yeah. The Crypt Keeper was so funny. He should Not go on stand-up. Those puns were unbelievably funny. Thank you. Uh, moving on, thank you so much, John. Uh, Ken Kersinger, you might know him in another mask, <laughs> the Jason mask, but you did so much more than that. You weren't just a movie monster. <laughs> you also did stunts. I would like for you to tell me where you got started and, and if you weren't just the guy in the mask, you know, and how that came to be for you. Uh, well, uh, many of you might know I, I started out as a stuntman and uh, read an article about stuntmen when I was like 12 years old. And, and uh, in college, I blew my knee out playing football. So I thought, well, now's a good time to go be a stuntman. <laughs> um, and uh, had a great career as a stuntman. One of the movies I got to work on first. Uh, as a stunt coordinator was uh, was uh, Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. Yeah. 
And uh, I was the stunt coordinator and the stunt double for Kane, and, and uh, got to play the fry cook who got killed. So I think Kane and I are the only two people who have played Jason and also been victims of Jason. <laughs> and uh, I uh, interviewed for the stunt coordinating job for, uh, for Jason, uh, Freddy vs. Jason. And uh, uh, I'm sitting there talking to the producer, and thank you. And uh, he started just looking at me, kind of funny, and, and finally he just said, listen, you know, we've been auditioning people from dancers to stunt people to, you know, but we need somebody, we want somebody your, your height and, and stature. And honest to God, the first words out of my mouth were, well, what about Kane? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had worked together, had a great rapport, so he said, well, we want somebody bigger, would you audition? So I auditioned for the part, which consisted of, of uh, putting on a mask, and, and they read the first scene of the girl swimming in the lake, and they had me react to it, and they had this extreme close-up on my eyes. And then they had me walk around the room. A couple days later, I get a phone call, uh, you know, would you come down and meet Ronnie Yu? So uh, I went down to meet Ronnie, and Ronnie is a Hong Kong director, and, uh, uh, you know, I was actually very surprised that they would have hired a, somebody from outside the United States to direct. And uh, I walked in the office, he shook my hand, and he, sa he said, I would like you to be Jason. And uh, that's how I ended up with the, uh, with the part. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's led to a few other acting things. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, check out Joyride 3. I get to play Rusty Nail. So I finally get to see something, but you still don't see me. Yeah, the Ken, Ken's being modest because, you know, Ken's up in Hollywood North in, in Vancouver, Canada. And, and I think Ken's been in more movies than all of us combined. <laughs> you know, when you really check his resume out, because I can remember sitting around in the bar late at night with Ken and Kim. And, yeah, when I was doubling, blah blah blah, and I was like, Ken, you were in that? Well, yeah. You know. I, I, I just uh, I, when I sat down, I had to check out John's sign, and he, he did Reefer Madness in Vancouver, and I worked on Reefer Madness as a as a stunt performer and a, a zombie and the uh, the uh, uh, security for the for the president in that. And then Tommy and I worked together on It, uh, which was also done in Vancouver. Years ago. And, uh, and I don't believe I had the honor of working with Nick yet, but uh, we're still alive, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. He's known as the Halloween MVP. Yeah, he wore the Michael Myers mask, but Mr. Tommy Lee Wallace over here created the mask. The iconic Michael Myers mask that haunts everybody in these Halloween movies. Production designer, editor, would you care to continue? Everybody should be bowing down to this man, especially if you're a Halloween fan. <laughs> I do have a, a direct question for you though, because you are the Halloween MVP and this is probably very close to your heart. If anybody reads online message boards, it is completely divided between people who like the original as opposed to the Rob Zombie remake, and they're not nice about it. It's nasty. Where do you stand in all that? I prefer the original. Thank you! So the <laughs> That's not really a fair question, because to be perfectly honest, I haven't seen the new ones. Maybe I'll like them better. <laughs> Not. Uh, John Carpenter and I go back to childhood together. We grew up in the same town. And uh, we became close as teenagers, got in a rock and roll band together. And John always knew from like age nine what he wanted to do when he grew up. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a film director. The whole concept was beyond me. Uh, but anyway, long story short, that part of it anyway, uh, when it came time to go off and find a school that would teach John how to be a filmmaker, I took him by the hand up to uh, our local university library and showed him this big fat blue book. And it, he found the one he wanted, which was USC Cinema. And so off he went. I went off to art school in Ohio. And uh, after I graduated, rejoined him with uh, classmate Nick Castle over here. So it was a very small family. We made, uh, the three of us instantly formed the Coupe de Villes, another musical group, and uh, started doing everybody's soundtracks and, and, 
and learning to love each other. It was, it was really fun and really family. And so fresh out of, uh, as John was getting out of school, he was walking out of there with his student film called Dark Star. And uh, we helped in various capacities on the weekends because it was one of those movies you made out of your trunk. The, the way that movie got made was the way people are making movies now, right out of the trunk of their car, which is the greatest. Uh, but after Dark Star came Assault on Precinct 13, John found out I had some art background, so I did uh, art directing on that. And when it was done, I was dismayed to find that John was going off into the cutting room. And I was like, I was accustomed to following the film in there. And I said, let me do something. He said, can you cut sound effects? Oh, yeah. No problem. 35 millimeter. Never touched 35 millimeter before. And uh, that's okay, learn on the job. Wasn't much pay involved anyway. But uh, after that, John developed enough confidence in me. <laughs> <laughs> Proper introduction, <laughs> Miss Linda Blair. Thank you, Ed. I, I appreciate the, the answer. I know, uh, how long did you work closely with uh, Nick Castle over here? Because you were both part of this Halloween, and at the time there weren't a whole lot of movie monsters. You basically had to invent the wheel for everybody. Um, a friend of mine, like, how do you do that? How do you decide what's scary? You just can't walk around just well, pretending they, to kill people. Everybody, we were flying by the seat of our pants, but John was so imbued with confidence. He knew what he wanted. He was long since birth a fan of horror movies and so he was prepared to step up and do the next big thing the next chapter and um, so uh, when this Halloween got off the ground John had enough confidence in me to ask me to do both production design and editing don't ever do that it's <laughs> that's stupidly hard because there's no time for sleep uh, but and Nick had already served as, like, we wanted Nick around no matter what because we were buds, you know? And so Nick had served anybody who is a fan of Dark Star. Nick was the feet of the beach ball in Dark Star, a, a, an alien with a real personality. And so I think as a good luck charm, John invited him to come on the set and be the uh, man behind the mask we never called him Michael Myers. The script called him The Shape. And uh, so off we went into Halloween with a budget of about $28. And uh, everybody doing 10 jobs and carrying. Jamie Lee Curtis, great sport, she carried camera cases. You know, it was a terrific little family. But uh, about a four week shoot. Uh, Real fast, John was on his game. It was really the first time, except for the French Connection, that the glide camera became popular, and John used it extremely well and kind of developed the language of modern scary movies right there and then. The issue about the mask was, go find a kind of a blank face mask, Tommy. See what you can do. And uh, <clears throat> I went out there and I was always into choices for John. I wanted to give him not one location, but two. Which one do you like? John was more the kind of accepting whatever. Yeah, just that one. That one's fine. Let's go. Because yeah, John loved to keep things simple, move fast, and boy, you know, you know the results. Just terrific stuff. But I went down to Hollywood Boulevard and found uh, a, a gimmick store, a mask store that had uh, all sorts of uh, decorations and party supplies and Halloween masks and uh, looked up on the shelf for a blank face and it's like, okay, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Mr. Spock. Uh, who's the guy next to Mr. Spock? Oh, oh, Captain Kirk. It just looked like a guy. It didn't look like Captain Kirk, really. And it was like... <laughs> Got to have that one. And uh, also grabbed an Emmett Kelly mask, for those who can recall. It was uh, the Sad Sack Clown mask. Thought that could be eerie. And brought them both back. And I, I modified the, uh, uh, the Captain Kirk mask quite a bit. 
and you can come over to my table and I'll give you the details of that. But uh, put that up and also the clown mask. And we modeled the clown mask first. And the clown came out and stood around, you know, like that. And it was like, oh my God, that's kind of scary. That could really be good. And then we modeled the other one. And when that guy walked out of the dressing room, it was just, oh, fuck me. <laughs> we, uh, we knew right then and there that before you get to the script, before you get to John's brilliant directing, before you get to Dean Cundy's magic, before you get to whatever I contributed in the art department, all of it, we knew we had a scary movie just shooting that guy, just shooting that guy. And that guy, of course, was Nick Charles Castle, private detective. And Nick, jump in this conversation. You're right there, too. What was your experience like working on these Halloween movies and working alongside Tommy? Oh. And then did y'all ever fight over who was going to play Mike? <laughs> uh, Nick can tell that. Yeah. Tommy has told my entire life story now to you. <laughs> so I have nothing more to say. No, let's see. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, the, the, this is a good uh, reminder to anyone out there that wants to be a filmmaker, be, make friends with your fellow filmmakers at film school, because they could be the person that winds up getting you your first job. Very important. That happened for me, that's for sure. But uh, the relationship with, uh, on this film was I wanted to be a director soon as well, and, John was directing this uh, very close to where I lived, and I went down to uh, the set that they were creating, asked if I could hang around, and I think it was just off the top of his head, he said, why don't you be the shape? Why don't you just be this character? That means you'll be here. Well, let me interject that uh, Nick uh, grew up in a show business family. His father was a famous choreographer. And I think it just came in in the DNA that you had a great way of moving. Not, a, uh, not an athlete kind of way or any other kind of way. It certainly didn't lurch around like a monster. You moved, <laughs> you moved extremely well, and I think John noticed that and valued it. <laughs> That's, that may be true. <laughs> Um, but uh, as far as uh, I think a lot of you know this, these, these stories that have followed the saga of Halloween or listened to uh, some of the uh, comments uh, on the DVDs that uh, uh, both Tommy and I uh, did a lot of the work on that picture. Uh, Tommy's, uh, Tommy's work is basically how it interacted with the set as you, as you noticed he, uh, as you found out he was the production designer which creates the sets, so he knew where to put his hand through the wall, or to, through the hand through the door. Um, Uh-oh. So, um, so uh, those were the kind of uh, um, uh, decisions we made based on who was under the mask. And then there were other things like uh, a stunt coordinator would do a fall, etc. But that was really my uh, connection. I didn't uh, have much of a uh, an, uh, understanding or uh, about that genre, and all I did was follow direction, John's wonderful direction, of course. Everyone, like, a lot of people like the whole head tilt while he's uh, stabbed a kid against the wall. That's John just telling me, Nick, tilt your head during the course of the filming. So, you know, a lot of things are uh, kismet, and uh, things come together uh, uh, because of the relationships you have and because of, you know, people that are very talented. Uh, I went on to uh, do a lot of movies as a director, and that was very helpful to, to be around those that, that particular film, to watch John and Dean Cundy and Tommy uh, uh, really uh, uh, do a, a picture with, uh, with that kind of production value at that kind of money, because my first film was going to be a little, just a little bit more than that, but with the same kind of uh, challenges. So uh, that's it. Now I'm retired. My next production is going to be the obstacle course for my grandson's birthday party. You're all invited <laughs> October 17th at my house. See you there. How old does your grandson have to be before you let him watch these scary movies that you worked on? 
Oh, he's, he won't watch Frozen. He's afraid of oh. Frozen. <laughs> and he's got to wait a while. <laughs> a little late, but we love her anyway. Miss Linda Blair, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to San Antonio. You know how many people out here are you terrified? I'm me included. But you were just a little thing. You were just a little girl. Did you realize? the darkness and the, just the depth of The Exorcist and how haunted it still is to people today, including myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm live. <laughs> Looking a lot better from the by Hey, everybody, nice to see you. What a wonderful group we have here, yay! Okay, the 30-second answer, no, yes, yes, no. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> I come from uh, Connecticut. I modeled and did commercials in New York City. There was no Hollywood there, very little filmmaking. So I wanted to be a veterinarian, which is why I do the work with animals today. And we put my money away so I could go to school. Well, right about the time I was going to retire, a little movie came along based on a novel that was very popular called The Exorcist. It was a long process to hire whoever would do the role. They put me um, through many, many interviews wanted to make sure I was mentally stable. They liked the fact that I didn't have a strong interest in the content of the novel. Children don't understand religion. That's something learned. That is something adults have knowledge of and are constantly working on their spirituality. So for me, the work was difficult. The makeup with Dick Smith, extraordinary, but something I didn't understand as a young person. So when the film was all done, I had no idea what had just happened. <laughs> For a year and a half, it was just, what are they doing? They created special effects that had never been done. They created just exactly what you're talking about. Everything is always creating. Now a lot has been done because we were sort of the, the beginning of all of that. We created a magic show that on camera that had never been done. You could not make The Exorcist today because of the computer generated technology, you would all be laughing at it instead of being curious still how we made it. How, how did I levitate? That's my business. <laughs> uh, I Remember, really practice, guys. practice, practice. I so, don't want to take up too much time. Um, I would love for you to finish your question, but I do want to open it up to you guys while she finishes her question. If you want to start lining up, I want to keep it short, one question each, but feel free to step up to the microphones, get in a line, and we'll kind of go tandem back and forth. I want to answer them to answer your questions as many as we can, okay? So, I'm sorry, go on. <laughs> All right, I'm being told we got five minutes. So just a couple of questions here if you want to dive in. Okay. Let's do this. Hi, my name's Crystal. My birthday's in two days, so this is the best way to spend my birthday. I'm so excited to be here. Um, it's basically for uh, Mr. Voorhees and Mr. Myers. You guys don't speak much in your movies, so wow. if you did speak as you're about to kill your victim, what would you say and how would you say it? Good question. Good question. <laughs> I have to say, every time I hear the Crypt Keeper's voice over the announcements, I get chills. It still gets me. I would have to hand it over to the Crypt Keeper for, for my voice. Because I don't do voices. I'm not an actor. As you may have noticed. No, you wouldn't have noticed. I was behind the mask, remember? You couldn't see any acting. There was no acting to be done. Give me a shot. What would you say? <laughs> See? 
I guess I'm not a voice actor either. I think you'd, pro you'd probably look into the eyes and go, enjoy the ride, it's going to be your last. <laughs> awesome, thank you. We gotta do this, let's do it, go on. <laughs> How does it feel to know that like, even nowadays, we're still comparing scary movies, scary voices to everything that you've done back then. Like, is it, is it like a feeling of accomplishment? Are like, y'all like happy to know that you're like the pinnacle of horror, pretty much for horror movies? I want to say, I had no idea until I attended the first of several of these kind of events and realized there were so many knowledgeable, caring fans out there. I, we made movies, it was like, okay, we made the movie, da, 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 da. and maybe even made a little bit of money out of it, but until we started coming to these things and you incredible people out there showed up, I had no idea. Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, this is a dream come true to me. Watching your movies to this day brings me warm fuzzies. It's, it's a great feeling. Um, kind of a two-part question. Um, which song is the, the best? I'm, I'm still indecisive between Exorcist and the Michael Myers Halloween, which is the best, in your opinion. And for Jason, what was it like all those years having that wonderful part and not anything to say? Can, can, can I just comment on the music really fast? They're both beautiful scores. You're right. But that's called, it's a score. It's a beautifully uh, orchestrated uh, a, a soundtrack. I know with The Exorcist, Tubular Bells, Mike Oldfield, that was tossed in the garbage. Billy Freakin found that in a throwaway trash can. That's a true story. Mike Oldfield, it was passed on, and he found it, and he said, that's it. And look how iconic it is. And the same thing with, with Halloween. So they're, they're actually both very beautiful. It, uh, Exorcist came first, I believe, didn't it? Uh, yes. And <laughs> I, I thought so because I think John took some inspiration from the tubular bells for uh, the Halloween theme. Let's keep that between us, okay? <laughs> okay, we won't tell us so. And then I think you had a second question? I did. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, being a stuntman, my background being stunt work, it's very, it's all physical. You're, you're oftentimes doubling actors, and you have to double the way they move, and, and uh, so it, it really played to my strong suit, uh, you know, not having dialogue in that, in that movie. Um, fortunately, it's gotten me some recognition, and I've gone on to do some other acting, and, and uh, you know, it, it helped prepare me for that, so I think, I think it really helped me. Thank you. I, yeah, think could... it, I think it's also uh, should be noted that uh, sometimes I believe we go back and strike chords that resonate all the way back to silent pictures like The Hunchback of Notre Dame or uh, um, uh, Nosferatu, si great silent pictures. I really get a sense from time to time about that in these movies. They're si sometimes they're just silent movies. We have to hurry, you guys. We, we, uh, yeah, right. they're already so saying. Let's, do we, we got a couple more, people. Or is it, yeah, yeah, I, we can't. I'm sorry, but we could no, do this take, for hours. You guys we'll are all set up more. out there. We'll people take, are welcome to come, meet every single one of you, and ask a question, right? You're going to be here today and tomorrow? Yeah, come to our tables. Ask what, you know, if, you, if you're curious, we'll, we'll talk perfect. about it. Perfect, perfect. All right, we were given 10 more minutes. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Comic Con. <laughs> Give us 10 more minutes if you want to keep going. That's what they just said. Because we started so late. Go ahead and ask the next question. You are, you are next. Stop where you are. We're not done yet. They, they, the Comic-Con gods gave these guys 10 more minutes. So you want to do it? Let's do it. Is how about, how about, is uh, your mic on? How about two more Hello. questions? Oh, yeah, that work. How about okay. two more questions? How about two more questions? Oh, two, more. two more questions. Wait, this gentleman right here. So I had a question for you specifically, being the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Uh -huh. uh, is there a particular episode or story that ever did, just kind of stuck with you and kind of gave you the creeps long after that you saw that episode? Well, I mean, you know, so many of them were so funny. 
you yeah, know. So, I mean, it's, to me, I mean, I, I always thought, you know, the tongue-in-cheek of it all was yeah. was kind of the the idea behind it. And I had, I had collected the comic books as a kid. So, I'm, I mean, I wasn't just somebody who wound up, it, it was kind of kismet that I wound up doing Tales from the Crypt, but I, I collected the comic books as a kid, so I was really, I was really into it. Um, one episode that really stuck with me, though, and it's because of his performance, mm -hmm. is Tim Curry in Death of Some Salesman. Thanks. Because he was, he was just fabulous as the father, the mother, and the daughter. And I had taken, my parents were in town to see, uh, see me and they wanted to see a shoot. And I took them down the day they were shooting. Tim Curry was this hunchback woman with hammer toes and earth shoes. And, these, and they had no idea it was Tim Curry. They couldn't believe it. And um, so that one really stuck with me because of his performance is really incredible. But I think very often that's what you remember and haunts you very often is the visceral aspects of a horror movie. I mean, nowadays they, they bring it to you, as Linda was saying, with all the CGI and stuff. And you know, somebody walking backwards like a crab, how many more movies are we gonna have to see that? But it is an image that stays with you. But when you're creating it the way these guys did, and Tales of the Crypt was done, and you know, I mean, this guy, the texture he brought to what he was doing, and and the Crypt Keeper bringing, letting you know that each week you were going to have a good time. He was kind of like that ramp going up to the top of the roller coaster before you went down. And that's really what stays with you with horror and why it's so popular with everybody. It's a it's a, a roller coaster ride that we we, we should have, always remember. We got we got we we we're down to seven minutes. So thirty second answers we can do it. Thank you. Real quick, Ms. Blair, this is for you. Just like with the omen dealing with religion and faith, did anything spooky happen in y'all set? There were there was a lot of PR that was put out and once they realized that it backfired and it wasn't necessary and the film would carry itself and it actually came back on me, the innocent kid, that's why they kind of tried to put me out and around the world so people would realize I was just a normal kid and it was just an amazing character that I played and, and that was all. So I didn't see anything that was ever mentioned. Oh, okay, thank okay. you. Uh -huh. Thank you guys, thank you. Uh, Mr. England. Uh, over the years playing uh, Freddy Krueger, I've seen you play different versions, a very playful one, a very sinister, dark version of him, especially in the first film, and New Nightmare. For you as an actor, which was your favorite version of the play of? I like my acting in part four, because I they sort of left me alone, and it's more physical. And, you know, I danced pretty, we were talking about Nick Castle and, and, and inspiration. I actually took a little bit from Nosferatu, but I also took a little bit from Bob Fosse because my claw drops a shoulder naturally. I look kind of like a gunfighter, which is asymmetrical. So I kind of used a little bit of that Bob Fosse asymmetrical movement. I was inspired with that. Sounds weird, but that's just the kind of crap actors all have. I had the hat, the way I reveal the baldness, yeah. Um, five, six, seven, eight. No, but it's true, guys. It's. You, you uh, actors borrow from different weird things. So I was a combination of Nosferatu, a little bit of Jimmy Cagney, a little bit of the opening of Gunsmoke pose with the dropped arm ready to pull out the gun, and even a little bit of, of Bob Fosse in there. So we, we bring all different things. Uh, uh, I think the best film is one, it's the scariest. Uh, my favorite is Seven because it's the richest and can be watched the most times. And I think if they took a poll, the fan favorite would be part three, Dream Warriors. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We got time for one more and we gotta let it go. There's other people using this stage. But again, they're gonna be waiting for you out there, ready to talk to each and every one of you. Hop in, go for it. All right, first off, I'm glad that y'all are here. Y'all are really awesome. If y'all had to look back on like your respective film series or TV series, is there one that you like look back on and say, wow, that one was the worst or like that was the weakest of like each film series? Because I know everybody's got a different opinion on which one was good, which one was bad. But I'd just like to ask out of y'all's respective series, did y'all have one where you're like, that one was just the worst? For me, zombies versus werewolves. They lied to me in London. <laughs> Probably part of the seventh season of Tales from the Crypt. 
they shot in London. I don't think the I don't think the the British actors got it so much, you know. But uh, it was it wasn't that bad. But if you had if I had to say the worst, it would probably be that. Yeah. Okay. I don't I don't have uh, one that stands. I've worked on so many pieces of crap. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just leave it there. One one of my favorites of Ken's was hot hot licks and and leatherette. <laughs> I think I come from the other end of this question because, uh, like I was saying before, coming to these festivals, I'm starting to appreciate movies I thought were pieces of shit. <laughs> so, I guess the short answer to your question is no, I don't have a, a favorite bad version. I'm good. <laughs> and we also have Saturday the 14th. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to San Antonio. We all love you.